in Eve's mind. Did God really say that? And she went, well, I'm not quite sure. I have to remember what he said or not. And at some point, it had the action of disobedience, arguments, pretensions. Pretensions are a simulation or a counterfeit for the purpose of laying claim to what is not its own. A pretension that comes in and it pretends it's the truth. It has you begin uh, excusing away actions. It has you looking at a situation and setting up so much evidence against the situation or against the person so that you have now brought excuse to an action that's not God's heart. Unforgiveness falls into that zone. Pretension that sets up like that. But look at this verse that it all ends with. It says, and to take captive, which means to lead away, to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Can you imagine that there are going to be those thoughts that ring your doorbell and you just are on the ball enough, you've gotten in connection with God enough that you say, you know what, you're not coming across the threshold. As a matter of fact, I, thought, I want you to put on these shackles on your ankles, on your wrists, and I'm going to haul you out right to where I put my garbage and I'm going to lock you down right there. You're not coming in the house. I'm going to lead away those thoughts. I'm going to stop them before they begin. And the enemy uses these things through demonic attack often. Just bombards us, bombards our mind, and bombards our thought processes. Is this making sense so far? Can you say amen? Okay, so we got four things very quickly in just a few minutes that I want to tell you about strongholds. Number one, some strongholds come due to deception. Some strongholds come due to deception. These are lies. These are lies. And the lies are on a mission to combat the truth in your life. The lies are going to be there as you're, as you're a new Christian, tell you you're not good enough and you haven't really changed. The lies are going to directly combat the things that the Word of God says over you. So when you find that you're just getting beat up by the enemy, you need to be able to say, wow, wait a second, if he's the father of all lies, then maybe the exact opposite of what he's saying is the truth about me. We don't think like that enough. If he's telling you you can't, you need to understand it's because he's afraid you can if he's telling you he'll never make it, you need to understand that he's quaking in his boots because he sees the destiny God's put on your life. If he's telling you you'll always be in bondage to this thing, always be in the slave to this thing, know that he's afraid because God's declared your freedom. And just assign the opposite to whatever the enemy is saying about you. Assign the opposite of the doorbell being rung. Assign the opposite to it. Say, wait a second. There must be somewhere in that book, if I dig or if I ask enough friends, I'm going to find somewhere in there to totally reverse this lie that the enemy wants me to believe. He has to fabricate them and formulate them. These lies start small because that's what works. The enemy would never come at you with a full-blown, massive, dramatic kind of lie. He's going to start small because it's what works. The Bible tells us to be alert. The Bible tells us, Take careful attention to our thoughts. These small lies amplify and catch up with us. I want to read you a testimony from a lady. Her name is Judy. I want to read you a testimony real quick. Listen to this. I'm a wife, a mother and grandmother, and at the age 66, my life is just this side of perfect. But it wasn't always that way. Here's the short version. After the birth of our second son, I began to experience something now commonly known as postpartum depression. Very little was known concerning that treat the treatment of it in 1974. The quick fix of the medical field was Valium. Not feeling comfortable with that and the care of small children, I declined. Postpartum depression is largely due to the fluctuating levels of hormones following pregnancy. Its symptoms vary each with each woman, involving seasons of crying, the general feeling of not being able to cope, and mild depression. These symptoms usually go away within days or weeks. Mine never did. Instead, they increased with each passing year. Two years later, in complete desperation, I saw a doctor. I explained that I was both emotionally and physically depleted and not sleeping at all. This was a particular problem because beside caring for the home and our boys, I was now working full-time 
all the while my husband was away in full-time ministry. I explained my feelings of despair and hopelessness. So many situations around our lives seem to be crumbling, and again, this is the short version. The grandfatherly type doctor that I went to see looked at this young and desperate mother and said, get over it, we're all tired, and we all have problems. He had been the first person I'd opened up to, and as I choked back tears, I vowed that he would be the last. This turned out to be a very big mistake, because secrets are very rarely healthy. I, re I retreated to the quietness and darkness of my bedroom, sometimes for a day or two at a time, coming out only to bathe or use the restroom. I knew that my family could tell that the majority of the time alone was spent in tears. It was another eight years of thinking that I was losing my mind and that surely God didn't care about me. Satan took full advantage of, the physical, of this physical condition and turned it into a spiritual one as well. In the early 80s, everything came to a head and I tried to take my life. I didn't think I could handle the pain of another day. I felt as though I was trapped in a deep, dark hole. Every day I was going through the motions, but every day feeling more hopeless and more desperate inside. What happened to the little girl who had been raised in church all her life? The one who married her Prince Charming right out of Bible college. All she ever wanted was to serve the Lord and to raise her precious children to do the same. How did suicide ever begin to be an option? Well, thankfully, my attempt to bring closure to my pain was unsuccessful, and God intervened so powerfully in my life. Well, the fact is, is I know this story very well because the lady that we're talking about, her name is Judy Mayners, and that's my mom's story, that when I was 13 years old, she came to a place of believing the enemy's lie, and the actions that followed could have been devastating. They could have been devastating. In so many ways, the enemy wanted to take her out of the game. Somebody who might be a bit pious might think, well, then she was just weak. No, there was nobody who had more people in church every Sunday than my five-foot-two mama. There was nobody who spent more time, coffee and cake with people of other nationalities and other belief systems, talking to them about Jesus and leading them to the Lord. There was nobody who did more than that. There was nobody who was better at it. Her fault was to believe the lie. Her fault was to not know the fullness of God's promises for her life. And the enemy cares to do that kind of damage. You see, deception begins in the mind and it ultimately changes the track of our actions. Did she think she was going to take that to such an extreme? No. Did she feel like that you know, was going to be the case a year away from her? Did, did she feel like that was going to be the, did she feel like she was going to leave her, her, her young boys motherless? No, no. But deception makes that track change. There's a great book that I've read uh, probably ten times, with no exaggeration, eight or ten times. Uh, the book's called The Three Battlegrounds by Francis Frangipane. And one of the quotes in it says this, Many of our opinions about life are, are ours only because we know of no other way to think. What you don't know can kill you. We just don't know any other way to think it. We don't know the truth. We don't know what God's promises are. And the enemy wants to capitalize upon that lack of knowledge. But when we know truth, it establishes an accurate and steadfast foundation. Very quickly, and we're going to buzz through the rest of these very quickly. In John chapter 8, you don't necessarily need to turn there, but I want you to see this important verse that Jesus said. In John chapter 8, verse 31, it says this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, or how about we say the word truth? If you hold to my truth, then you're really my disciples. Then you're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you hold to my truth, you're going to be my disciples. And it's then that you'll know my truth and you'll know freedom because of that truth. And later on in verse uh, 36, it says, so if the son sets you free, then you're really going to be free indeed. When my mama got free, when she got to that place that that depression was no longer a problem, it was no longer an issue for her, it was because of the freedom that Christ had spoken over her. 